Say it ain't true. It's dirt that we're made of. And often return to. Often return. Well, don't search too long for this gold that you see. Too deep to dig for, and your arms too. Don't you worry, my son. Got the dirt in the soil, flowers still grow there. Flowers still grow. Slow down, found his glory, planted in the earth. So don't search too long for this gold that you see. It's too deep to be for. Your arms to weave. Don't you worry, my son. About people hating, love is still the Lord. Love is still. Good afternoon and welcome once again to Our Lady and St. Charles Borromeo for our Good Friday service of the Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Just a slight apology to begin with in that I had originally intended to be singing a little bit more of the um, intercessions but unfortunately my new spectacles haven't arrived and I'm finding it rather difficult <laughs> to read the small print in between the musical bits. And so uh, I'm cheating. I will be reading them, but there we are. 
There's a wee scratch about there. You can't see it, but I can. <laughs> but there we are. Anyway, we are gathered today for the commemoration, the celebration of our Lord's Passion. And perhaps the best thing we can do is to start with an old favourite. All ye who seek a comfort sure. As I say, you should have the words um, sent out to you. Some of you got them on the Facebook, ebook, whatever. They're all there. Sing along because there's no one else singing but thee and me. And if it's only me, well, that <laughs> it could be fun. Just adjust the volume a little. Let us pray. Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection, sanctify your servants, for whom Christ your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal mystery, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant will prosper. He shall be lifted up, exalted, rise to great heights. As the crowds were appalled on seeing him, so disfigured did he look that he seemed no longer human, so will the crowds be astonished at him, and kings stand speechless before him. For they shall see something never told, and witness something never heard before. Who could believe what we have heard, and to whom has the power of the Lord been revealed? Like a sapling he grew up in front of us, like a root in arid ground. Without beauty, without majesty we saw him, 
no looks to attract our eyes, a thing despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, a man to make people scream their faces. He was despised, and we took no account of him. And yet, ours were the sufferings he bore, ours the sorrows he carried. But we, we thought of him as someone punished, struck by God and brought low. Yet he was pierced through for our faults, crushed for our sins. On him lies a punishment that brings us peace, and through his wounds we are healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each taking his own way, and the Lord burdened him with the sins of all of us. Harshly dealt with, he bore it humbly, he never opened his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughterhouse, like a sheep that is dumb before its shearers, never opening its mouth. By force and by law he was taken, would anyone plead his cause? Yes, he was torn away from the land of the living, for our faults struck down in death. They gave him a grave with the wicked, a tomb with the rich, though he had done no wrong, and there had been no perjury in his mouth. The Lord has been pleased to crush him with suffering, if he offers his life in atonement, he shall see his heirs, he shall have a long life, and through him what the Lord wishes will be done. His soul's anguish over, he shall see the light and be content. By his sufferings shall my servant justify many, taking their faults on himself. Hence I will grant whole hordes for his tribute. He shall divide the spoil with the mighty for surrendering himself to death and letting himself be taken for a sinner, while he was bearing the faults of many and praying all the time for sinners. The Word of the Lord. And for the psalm, again, we will sing together. But if you just want to join the chorus, that's fine. The chorus is beautiful and easy to sing. You could join in the verses as well if you wish. Let's be honest. Who's going to stop you? Hmm? It's your own home after all. There has to be an easier way of doing this. There we are. Oh, my God. 
beside me. I call your name. Listen to me, my people. Give ear to me, my nation. A will flows from me, and my justice for a while. To the people. Turn to me, O man, and be saved, says the Lord, for I am God. There is no other God beside me. I call your name. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Since in Jesus, the Son of God, we have the supreme high priest who has gone through to the highest heaven, we must never let go of the faith that we have professed. For it is not as if we had a high priest who was incapable of feeling our weaknesses with us, but we have one who has been tempted in every way that we are, though he is without sin. Let us be confident, then, in approaching the throne of grace, that we shall have mercy from him and find grace when we are in need of help. During his life on earth, he offered up prayer and entreaty, aloud and in silent tears, to the one who had the power to save him out of death, and he submitted so humbly that his prayer was heard. Although he was son, he learned to obey through suffering. But having been made perfect, he became for all who obey him the source of eternal salvation and was acclaimed by God with the title of High Priest of the Order of Melchizedek. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kedron Valley. There was a garden there, and he went into it with his disciples. Judas the traitor knew the place well, since Jesus had often met his disciples there, and he brought the cohort to this place, together with a detachment of guards sent by the chief priests and the Pharisees, all with lanterns and torches and weapons. Knowing everything that was going to happen to him, Jesus then came forward and said, Who are you looking for? They answered, Jesus the Nazarene, he said, I am he. 
Now Judas, the traitor, was standing among them. When Jesus said, I am he, they moved back and fell to the ground. He asked them a second time, who are you looking for? They said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus replied, I have, I have told, told you that I am he. If, if I, I am the one you are looking for, for let these others go. This was to fulfill the words he had spoken. Not one of those you gave me have I lost. Simon Peter, who carried a sword, drew it and wounded the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back in its scabbard. Am I not to drink the cup my father has given me? Father has given me. The cohort and its captain and the Jewish guards seized Jesus and bound him. They took him first to Annas, because Annas was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had suggested to the Jews, it is better for one man to die for the people. Simon Peter, with another disciple, followed Jesus. This disciple, who was known to the high priest, went with Jesus into the high priest's palace, but Peter stayed outside the door. So the other disciple, the one known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who was keeping the door, and brought Peter in. The maid on duty at the door said to Peter, Aren't you another of that man's disciples? He answered, I am not. Now it was cold, and the servants and the guards had lit a charcoal fire and were standing there warming themselves. So Peter stood there too, warming himself with the others. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly for all the world to hear. I have always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews meet together. I have said nothing in secret, but why ask me? Ask my hearers what I taught, they know what I said. way to answer the high priest? Jesus replied, If there, if there is something, is something wrong, wrong with what I what said, I said point, point it out. out. But if there, if is, there no is no offense in it, why do you strike me? me? Then Anna sent him, still bound, to Caiaphas the high priest. As Simon Peter stood there warming himself, someone said to him, Aren't you another of his disciples? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relation of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and at once a cock crew. They then led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was now morning. They did not go into the praetorium themselves, or they would be defiled and unable to eat the Passover. So Pilate came outside to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They replied, If he were not a criminal, we should not be handing him over to you. Pilate said, Take him yourselves and try him by your own law. The Jews answered, We are not allowed to put a man to death. This was to fulfill the words Jesus had spoken, indicating the way he was going to die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and called Jesus to him and asked, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, Do you ask this of your own accord, or have others spoken to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? It is your own people and the chief priests who have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus replied, Mine is not a kingdom of this world, if my kingdom were of this world, my men would have fought to prevent me being surrendered to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this kind. Pilate said, So you are a king then? Jesus answered, It is you who say it. Yes, I am a king. I was born for this. I came into the world for this, to bear witness to the truth. And all who are on the side of truth, listen to my voice. Pilate said, Truth, what is that? And 
With that, he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no case against him, but according to a custom of yours, I should release one prisoner at the Passover. Would you like me then to release the king of the Jews? At this, they shouted, not this man, but Barabbas. Barabbas was a brigand. Pilate then had Jesus taken away and scourged, and after this the soldiers twisted some thorns into a crown and put it on his head, and dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they slapped him in the face. Pilate came outside again and said to them, Look, I am going to bring him out to you to let you see that I find no case. Jesus then came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said, Here is the man. When they saw him, the chief priests and the guards shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I can find no case against him. The Jews replied, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the son of God. When Pilate heard them say this, his fears increased. Re-entering the praetorium, he said to Jesus, Where do you come from? But Jesus made no answer. Pilate then said to him, Are you refusing to speak to me? Surely you know I have power to release you, and I have power to crucify you. Jesus replied, You have no power over me if it had not been given you from above. That is why the one who handed me over to you has the greater guilt of you has the greater guilt. From that moment, Pilate was anxious to set him free, but the Jews shouted, If you set him free, you are no friend of Caesar's. Anyone who makes him king is defying Caesar. Hearing these words, Pilate had Jesus brought out and seated himself on the chair of judgment at a place called the pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was Passover preparation day, about the sixth hour. Pilate said to the Jews, here is your king. They said, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said, do you want me to crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king except Caesar. So in the end, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. They then took charge of Jesus and carrying his own cross, he went out of the city to the place of the skull or, as it was called in Hebrew, Golgotha, where they crucified him with two others, one on either side with Jesus in the middle. Pilate wrote out a notice and had it fixed to the cross. It ran, Jesus the Nazarene, King of the Jews. This notice was read by many of the Jews because the place where Jesus was crucified was not far from the city, and the writing was in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the Jewish chief priests said to Pilate, you should not write king of the Jews, but this man said I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had finished crucifying Jesus, they took his clothing and divided it into four shares, one for each soldier. His undergarment was seamless, woven in one piece from neck to hem. So they said to one another, Instead of tearing it, let's throw dice to decide who is to have it. In this way, the words of Scripture were fulfilled. They shared out my clothing among them. They cast lots for my clothes. This is exactly what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdalene. Seeing his mother and the disciple he loved standing near her, Jesus said to his mother, Woman, this is your son. Then to the disciple he said, This is your mother. And from that moment the disciple made a place for her in his home. After this, Jesus knew that everything had now been completed, and to fulfill the scripture perfectly, he said, I am, I am thirsty. A jar full of vinegar stood there, so putting a sponge soaked in the vinegar on a hyssop stick, they held it up to his mouth. 
after Jesus had taken the vinegar, he said, It is accomplished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. It was preparation day, and to prevent the bodies remaining on the cross during the Sabbath, since that Sabbath was a day of special solemnity, the Jews asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken away. Consequently, the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with him and then of the other. When they came to Jesus, they found he was already dead. And so instead of breaking his legs, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a lance and immediately there came out blood and water. This is the evidence of one who saw it, trustworthy evidence, and he knows he speaks the truth, and he gives it so that you may believe as well. Because all this happens to fulfill the words of Scripture, not one bone of his will be broken. And again, in another place, Scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because he was afraid of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him remove the body of Jesus. Pilate gave permission, so they came and took it away. Nicodemus came as well, the same one who had first come to Jesus at night time, and he brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, following the Jewish burial custom. At the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in this garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been buried. Since it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was near at hand, they laid Jesus there. A reading from... passion. It's interesting to note that the scribes, the Pharisees, the leaders, the elders of the church, the temple, were very keen to make it clear that they were observing the law, and yet they were happy enough to allow an injustice to occur. Knowledge of the law is not sufficient to ensure that there is justice. One has to understand the context and the purpose, the meaning of the law. A law that our Lord had come to fulfill. As he clearly states many times through the Gospels, not one jot, not one tickle of the laws and the prophecies will be altered until it is fulfilled. But the ignorance of these men and women who condemned him is something that lingers to this day. Having knowledge without having understanding, it's a disaster. Wisdom, I've always felt, is about knowing how to make use of the gifts and the talents that you have. It's not about an accumulation of knowledge or facts. It's about understanding those facts, understanding their context. And on this Good Friday, there are many who will be asking themselves, why is it Good Friday? What's the point? There's nothing good going on at the moment. We're living in a world of pestilence. Well, we always have. It's just it happens to be affecting us at the moment. A few years ago, there was Ebola. And very few were bothered because it was in a particular place miles away. There has always been starvation. 
There have always been famines and floods, but not necessarily on my doorstep, therefore not my problem. We need to know the context and understand the significance of things. These events have meaning for us if we care to listen, if we actually bother to note and to look carefully that we do live in a common world and that what affects one element will affect us all. And we do need to care. There are others who will not be tuning in today, I suspect. There will be others who are fairly convinced that the whole religious thing is a fraud, it's a con. And their reasons for that are not dissimilar to the reaction that I have when I look at this piece of scripture and the way that the chief priests and the elders of the temple were behaving. The people who claimed to know God, who were telling people all about God and the facts, their life did not reflect that. And so people, or well, did they reject God? Or did they reject the teachers? See, that's, that's where I as a priest, that's where we all need as Christians to take very careful note. Are the people rejecting God or are they rejecting the way we represent God? People may, at this moment, be wrestling in a hospital trying to save patients, working a four-hour shift, four hours on, four hours off, absolutely exhausted, not able to get home to see their families, Where is God in their life? They're doing everything they can and yet patients still die. Perhaps in the hand that offered them a cup of tea. The listening ear. Perhaps that is where they will find God. In those acts of compassion of kindness, not in some, oh, this plague is a curse on us and blah, blah, blah. That's not God's way. Where do they find God if it is not in the compassion and love that we offer them? Our Lord, on his way to Calvary, encountered people. There was Simon of Cyrene, called from the crowd, and yet he willingly gave assistance. We know this because we know his brother's names, his parents, and he know he became a Christian. He helped Christ on his journey in that awful, horrific, terrible journey, a friend's hand came to assist. The women, Veronica, who wiped his face and was rewarded with an image transfixed upon her towel. And yet reality was, I believe, the image of Christ was never then left from her heart her kindness, her compassion. The women who wept. And there at the foot of the cross, his mother. And his faithful friend, John, the beloved disciple. Even in that darkest moment, there were people who had not abandoned him. And so it is for us. There may be many trials and tribulations and we may not succeed in all the things we want or try to achieve. 
But in those moments, there are friends. There are people who come to assist. And even though, even with their assistance, we may not accomplish the goal, achieve the aim, we are able to move on because we are given strength. And perhaps take on a different task. It's not that we've abandoned our original purpose, no. It's just that we have to draw strength, take a step back, regroup, and move forward again. And that can only be done with the help of friends. Friendship is in many ways the best witness to God's presence in our life. The kindness and the compassion that we show to one another. But most importantly, there is the kindness and the compassion that we can show to a stranger. The nurse, the doctor, the orderly, the porter, the little lady, the man who cleans up, the ambulance drivers, the paramedics. They don't know the people that they are caring for, but they're there at their side. Where is God in this pandemic? He is in the compassion and the love that we show to one another, the care that we give, the response that we make Are we acting responsibly? There will be those who will say, oh yes, I'm obeying the law, I'm doing whatever, but are they really, truly? Our Lord came into this world to ensure that we are able to live in peace and central to that is justice. And you do not have justice if all you know is the law. You have to understand its context, its meaning and purpose. And in that, you must understand each other. We must learn to trust and respect one another and care for one another. We've got an additional intercession. I'm just making sure I slip it into the right place. There we go. I now will recite the solemn prayers of intercession. If it's feasible for you to kneel in your place, then do. If not, then Stand or, if necessary, remain seated, but try to sit in a a reverential manner, not slouch back in the chair because, oh, it's good and comfy. But what I will ask is normally we bob up and down. I say a bit, we know, would not do that. Whichever position you're in, just keep that position, be it standing, sitting or kneeling. Just keep that position. Let us pray. Dearly beloved for the Holy Church of God, that our God and the Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her and to unite her throughout the whole world and grant that leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God the Father Almighty. Almighty, ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your mercy 
that your church spread throughout all the world may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our most holy father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord, who chose him for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favour on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you, their maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our Bishop Alan and for all bishops, priests and deacons of the church and for the whole of the faithful people. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed, Hear our humble prayer for your ministers. By the gift of your grace, all may serve you faithfully through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts, and unlock the gates of his mercy, that having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Almighty, ever-living God, who make your church ever fruitful, with new offspring, increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Almighty, ever-living God, who gathered what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for the Jewish people to whom the Lord our God spoke first that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Almighty, ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, 
that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter into the way of salvation. Almighty, ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart, they may find the truth and that we ourselves being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right in sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Almighty and ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you come to rest. Grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness to the good works done by those who believe in you and so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will, for the true peace and freedom of all. Almighty, ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of people, look with favour, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world the prosperity of peoples the assurance of peace, the freedom of religion, may through your gift be made secure through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who suffer the consequences of the current pandemic, that God the Father may grant health to the sick, strength to those who care for them, comfort to families, and salvation to all the victims who have died. Almighty, ever-living God, only support of our human weakness, look with compassion upon the sorrowful condition of your children who suffer because of this pandemic, Relieve the pain of the sick. Give strength to those who care for them. Welcome into your peace those who have died. And throughout this time of tribulation, grant that we may all find comfort in your merciful love. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Almighty, ever-living God, comfort the mourners, strengthen of all who toil. May the prayers of those who cry out in tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice 
because in their hour of need, your mercy was at hand through Christ our Lord. Amen. Behold, behold, the wood of the cross on which is hung a salvation. Oh, come, let us adore. Behold, behold, the wood of the cross, on which is hung a salvation. Oh, come, let us adore. Behold, behold, the wood of the cross on which is hung a salvation. Oh, come, let us adore. So we sing together, when I survey the wondrous cross. When I survey I 
We adore your cross, O Lord. We praise and glorify your holy resurrection. For behold, because the wood of the tree joy has come to the whole world. May God have mercy on us and bless us. May he let, us, let his face shed its light upon us and have mercy on us. We adore your cross, O Lord. We praise and glorify your holy resurrection. For behold, because of the wood of a tree, joy has come to the whole world. My people, what have I done to you? Or how have I grieved you? Answer me. Because I led you out of the land of Egypt, you have prepared a cross for your Saviour. Holy 
is God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy on us. Because he led you out through the desert forty years and fed you with manna and brought you into the land of plenty, you have prepared a cross for our Saviour. Holy is God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy on us. What more should I have done for you and have not done? Indeed, I planted you as my most beautiful chosen vine, and you have turned very bitter for me. For in my thirst you give me vinegar to drink, and with a lance you pierced your Saviour's side. Holy is God, holy and mighty, holy and not immortal one, have mercy on us. Wisdom, power, and adoration to the Blessed Trinity for redemption and salvation through the Paschal Mystery, now in every generation and for all eternity. Amen. It would now be customary to bring the reserved sacrament back from the altar of repose, but we will not be doing that today. However, as a family, let us now pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. And following the prayer of, of dismissal, we will sing a classic hymn together, our God is help in ages past. Let us pray. Almighty ever living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy that by partaking of his mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you through Christ our Lord. Amen. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honoured the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increased, and everlasting redemption be made secure through Christ our Lord. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.